<laughs> so far in these little interviews that I've been doing, I've only been interviewing people that I know and have worked with. And I am so excited to have the wonderful, the incredible <laughs> Jazz Ray Cole with me today. <sighs> <laughs> Jazz and I have been introduced through a mutual friend, and her story is incredible, and I cannot wait to share it. Jazz uh, grew up in Stockton, California, then went to L.A. You've been an actor since you were four years old, right? Mm -hmm. A professional actor since she was four. You're named Jazz because your mother was a dancer. She had a dance studio. And she yep. gave it all up for your career, your amazing career yep. that's been very fruitful so far. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so she she sacrificed that to go to L.A., support your career as a child actor. Mm -hmm. And you've gotten to be in some really great things. Your first movie was you were Angela Bassett's daughter in Waiting to Exhale. Mm -hmm. Then you were in <clears throat> My Wife and Kids. When you were 13, you were in Alvin Ailey Company. You yep. were in a ballet company where you were the youngest soloist in this South Carolina yep. ballet company. Incredible. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then your, your, your resume is so big that it's not even on one page because you've been a guest star in so many TV shows. You've, you've been on everything, really. I just and need to in my pocket so I have you and I need like a little boost of confidence. <laughs> Happily, happily. The more we get to know each other, I'll just record little things like, oh my God, do you realize? I'll give you a voice memo. Do I you love know who you're looking at in the mirror? Wait, is that the Chaz Rachel? Hold up, hold up. What? <laughs> I need um, it. I need it. <laughs> well, most importantly, you were Stanley's daughter in the office. So <laughs> I love that you say most importantly. That is one of my. <laughs> Your friend, she was so mad that I didn't tell her I was on the office, and I'm like, I don't watch it. <laughs> no idea. This is like a series. People who watch it like die for that show. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. for real. It's it's very important. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the most important pop culture references of our time, I think. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you you were in the quad with <laughs> the wonderful Eric Michelle. Yes. And yes. Then you went back to theater, you went back to training, mm -hmm. you just are continually going back into figuring out what it is that you want. Like you, it seems like to me that you've really taken your career in your own hands and you don't, you don't get pigeonholed. Like, okay, I started acting at four. I have to do this. I have to only do this. You've been a dancer. You've done theater. You've done film. You've kind of done it all. And you're super smart. <laughs> <laughs> some, some actor models, some, some beautiful people are just that. They're just beautiful people. But you've got a beautiful, exquisite brain on top of that or behind that beautiful face. So I cannot wait to have this conversation with you. Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> I am pumped up now. <laughs> yeah, let's get, let's get hyped up. Um, so first of all, tell me a little bit about your background, how you grew up in terms of voice. So we're talking today uh, mostly about voice. We'll talk about how brilliant and amazing you are as well within that. But with voice, like were you, were you from a loud family? What did people sound like and what was it like? So I was in between Stockton, California and L.A. And they're very, very different. Stockton's a small little country town outside of Sacramento. And when I went home, it's, you know, my grandma had eight kids and all of their kids had kids. So it's a billion cousins and aunt and uncles and everybody is talking and loud. Uh, <laughs> you Love know, that. and that's the volume of the house. And it's it's all love and, you know, we're playing games and everyone's screaming over who's winning. And um, But then when I came here to L.A., you know, I was in training. I was either in dance class, acting class, piano class and all of that. Not to say that it's quiet, but it's much more reserved than being in stock and being at home. Um, mm. So I've kind of been able to kind of have the best of both worlds, I guess you could say, because we were back and forth so much. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved to the East Coast, um, I think, you know, I lived in Boston. I lived in Jersey and New York and in South Carolina. And each one of those places, they communicate in very specific ways. New Yorkers excuse my French, don't give a fuck. They're going to say what they have to say as loud as they need to say it. You know, Boston's a little mm -hmm. bit more liberal in how they communicate. 
South Carolina. Meaning, meaning what? Can you describe that a little? They're, they, not to say that they think before they speak, because that's rude to say about New Yorkers, right? But, if, um, you know, Boston has a little bit more, they're just a little bit more reserved in how mm -hmm. they choose to express their opinions, depending on where you are mm -hmm. in Boston, of course. Um, and then the where South. Where was in Boston? I was in Cambridge. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was at Boston Ballet. My brother was at Harvard. So we would go, when I left Boston Ballet, he was still at Harvard. So we would go back a lot to Boston. And I, I love Boston. I love the East Coast in general. And then South Carolina, it's the South, you know? The South is the South. <laughs> You're in the South. So you know what I mean by well, that. But, but explain it a little bit. Um, I think my experience in the South is everything is one note. Everything is, they all sound and speak on the same level. Everyone's going to talk like this and every, everybody is going to respond like this. That was my experience in South Carolina. It's like the normal, <laughs> normal, the baseline is loud. <laughs> Everybody's going to talk. They're going to use their whole voice when they say something. And, you know, I was expecting to see some Southern bells. When I went to Georgia, I saw, you know, it was a little bit more demure, I guess you could say. But South Carolina was not that. <laughs> South Carolina was not that. Do you feel like that affected you at all? I feel like sometimes when I speak, people are like, are you from the South? Or are you from New York? I have a little bit of a twang of all these different places that I lived because I lived in all of those places before I was 18. So mm. I've grown up around all these different cultures and hearing different sounds and the way that they say this word is, you know, it just kind of, it, it's embedded in me. So. Right. The yeah, way we speak often is a reflection of your identity and where you've been. Yeah. So you pick up little things as you go along to different places and it's like presenting a charcuterie board of here's where I grew up. Here's who I am as you speak. <laughs> yep. And that's exactly mm. what it's, what my accent, I guess you could say is it's a mm. hosh posh of different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Now you, you and I have talked before how you feel like you sound really white or other people critique oh, you yeah. for sounding really white. What's that about you think? Listen, I don't know. I mean, I, I grew up, um, I went to an all white school. I was in ballet class. Um, but like I said, you know, my family is from Texas and Virginia. So even in my family, I was made fun of for my voice. I've been made fun of for my voice my entire life. And it used to up until very recently, and I mean like a few years ago, used to really, really bother me because when someone says to you, you sound like a white girl, you're the whitest black girl I know, that takes away your identity. My identity, I, I identify as a black woman. So if you tell me that I, uh, I don't sound like a black woman, you know, it, it just, there's something in that that, it eats away at you in a very, very different way. Mm. Um, and it's one of the things that we were talking about, you know, I wish I had had someone when I was growing up be like, you sound like what you sound like, you know, and I've tried, you know, I, <laughs> I was, <laughs> I, when I was a kid, I had, you know, I went to a fairly diverse school. Um, I was switched schools a lot, but one of the schools I went to was fairly diverse. And um, you know, there was, I had three friends, a black friend, a white friend and a Mexican friend. And my mom had taken us somewhere like McDonald's play place or something, you know, and to my white friend, it'd be like, oh my God, like, you know, and then to my Mexican friend, it'd be like, yeah, you know what I mean? And then like to my black friend, I'd be like, yeah, yo, you know what I'm saying? Like, it'd be a very different. And my mom, she got me in the car. She's like, honey, you, you can't, <laughs> you can't do that. You need to use your voice. But when you're made fun of for your what you sound like, you try to adapt things that make people uh, more comfortable, things that are more palatable for other people to hear. Um, mm -hmm. And up until recently, I, I really tried to not, I, it's like a part of the people pleasing, right? Like, okay, mm -hmm. well, if I sound like this amongst this group of people, I'll be accepted more, I'll be received, you know, I won't be kind of alienated or put into a box because with the the stereotype of you sound like a white girl also comes like oh she probably wants to be a white girl or you know what else is that what you know like why does she talk like that your voice is your voice you can't change your voice you know what i'm saying like how you sound is how you sound and you have to show up i have learned i have to show up authentically myself and that is in every 
every space. That means my voice. And if you think I sound like a a whitewashed black girl, I don't know what to tell you. You know, like <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. This is how I sound. And it's maybe a part of how uh, I grew up and the places that I was. And I, I don't know. Um, but I, that it is, it is really, really, really hurt me and affected me over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, what really, was the really process like of reckoning with that? If it's only happened recently in the last couple of years, what's this, what's the process been like? You know, I was in therapy and I was talking about, uh, you know, high childhood trauma, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, I was bullied in school because I was an actor. I was bullied. You know, I would get to go away for a week and kids would be like, oh, she's away for a week. And when I came back, it'd be like, you think you're better than us? And and that was one of the things. Oh, yeah. Was you still graduated two years early. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> So you were, you were like the, the working actor who was also smarter than them. So they were acting out of jealousy. I was a very straight A student. Like I'm very type A. I loved school. I, I still love to learn. Um, and so I think that, you know, being made fun of for something that you do, which you can't, you know, yeah. you do what you do and being made fun of for your voice because you sound different. And when I was younger, I had this like kind of squeaky high pitched voice. It was like, really high. Like you look at some of like the work I did when I was a kid and I have the squeakiest sounding voice and people still wait, do this. Wait, wait. Did you feel like you did or did other people tell you that you did? Oh, other people told me this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I'm, I'm not someone who watches my work. Right. And when mm -hmm. I was a kid, like that was the last thing I was thinking about is watching what, you know, right. I'm not thinking about that. Let me go um, watch me be Angela Bassett's daughter. Right? Like, <laughs> it's not an ever what, you know, a kid's thinking about. Um, and so I think for me dealing with some childhood trauma and trying to sift through what are my beliefs about myself and what are other people's beliefs about myself, mm -hmm. um, that was something. And what does being a black woman mean? What does it mean me, being a black woman mean to me specifically? And, you know, my family is very black. My mom is very pro-black. You know, she thought she was a black panther. She had her brown pleather jacket and her fro like Angela Davis and, you know, black history was really, really important um, in my family. And my mom is, you know, was very adamant about me knowing our history. Mm -hmm. um, so what does a black woman mean? You know, like, oh, does that mean you have to listen to black music? You sound like a black person. What is that? What does a black person sound like? You know, oh, you you dress like a black person. Like what what does being a black woman mean? And sifting through all that, I'm like, no, I identify as Black because I appreciate my heritage, my ancestors, and the history of what Black people have gone through. Mm -hmm. That I had to be grounded in knowing that, hey, I'm, this is me. And there are different versions of Black. There are different versions of every single culture. We don't all show up the same. That's just not a, a thing. You know, there's not one way to be Mexican. There's not one way to be Black. There's not one way to be Asian. And I think the the more that we start to open ourselves up to the realization that, oh, just because this was a stereotype for so long doesn't mean it needs to continue to be a stereotype. We're becoming a melting. You know, there's so many mixed children and we're, like we're a diverse like planet now you know everybody's kind of a melting pot so what does that mean like does a mixed person have to sound like this oh do they have to pick a side to sound white or to sound black you know what i'm saying like what like what what are we saying why can't you just show up authentically yourself mm -hmm. and i think the sound of somebody and i'm really sensitive about that like why are we judging what someone sounds like that is mm -hmm. one of the things that we cannot control Right. Why, but why do you think we do judge how someone sounds? I, I think that, you know, when you meet somebody, you're sizing that person up, right? Like everybody has some form of sizing that person up. And some people, you know, go a little bit step further and are judging from the second that they meet somebody. And one of the, you know, I think when you hear someone speak, it is a way for you to kind of determine, oh, the level of education just based off how they speak where they come from geographically, they come from the South, you know, like where they come from. But I think that in and of itself, okay, fine. 
But when it becomes like, oh, you look like this, so you should sound like that. That is, I don't understand where that comes from. I really, really don't. Mm -hmm. Um, I really, really don't. It's different if someone's like, I'm trying to, I'm putting on this air to sound like this in this moment. That's a whole different thing. Um, And yes, some people do that, right? No shade, do you. But I don't know why we would judge someone based off the way that they sound. Um, that is probably one of the things uh, like, and I, (laughs) I had a conversation with my manager about it because my manager was like, you know, I'd lost a job because they're like, it's her voice. And I spent all this money doing voice coaching to kind of like lower my voice and sound different. And I think probably what the, the voice thing was, was I was so afraid to sound like myself because my entire life I had been told not to sound like myself. So Uh, yeah. uh Uh-huh. It's, it's not. Yeah. uh, And so so the voice thing had nothing to do. It was just like, no, I'm not using the voice that I have. I am not showing up authentically myself using a hundred percent of myself because I have been told since I was yay high that this is how I'm supposed to sound. And because I don't sound like that, I am made fun of constantly. And when that becomes something that people can like stick the knife in and twist, you know, like, especially as a kid, like you're a kid, you know, like you're a child, you know, and you don't know what anybody has grown. You don't know what anybody's circumstances are, you know, Mm -hmm. and you, you sound like what you're around, right? It's Mm -hmm. If I've grown up in this environment, I don't have any control over what environment I grew up in because I was a child. That's how I sound. I was surrounded by these people. That's how I sound. Um, it's 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 interesting. I think I think I think we get so deterred from seeing somebody, like seeing them, the, from the way that they look or sound, that we're starting to kind of like the humanity part of it's missing to me. Mm. No. Wait, There's can you can you speak a little bit more on that? What do you mean? I mean, like, if I meet you and I'm like, oh, you sound like this and you look like this, I already have a prejudged notion of this, that, and the other versus being like, who is this person? Yeah, they sound like this and they look like this. And I could be like, oh, there was this person that I knew that sounded and looked exactly like her. So, but why? You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? But what? how do I relate that to who you are? Why am I not looking for who you are innately? Like who are, who you are at your core? What mm-hmm. is the way that you sound and the way that you look have to do with who you are at your core? And I know that's like, oh yeah, you know, beauty's on the inside, but it is. That's the truth. You know what I'm saying? That's the reason I think people take that out of context sometimes, but it's like, it's the truth. Like we need to see people who are themselves. We need to see mm-hmm. them as them, who they are inside versus being like all this exterior stuff, our voice, our hair, the way we look, our color, whatever it is. Like, yeah, you may identify as whatever, but who are you? But who isn't you? that the hardest question to answer for yourself? And showing up as and that person up. that you really feel you are, that can come with a lot of fear because people may not accept who you actually are at your core. And that's that's what I mean by like, I think that was the reason I was losing jobs is because I was so Mm. afraid to show up because it's like, well, if if they don't like this voice, that's me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Then that means they don't like me and my voice. And that's, you know, you'd much rather be like, oh, well, that's, I just put on that voice. So Mm -hmm. they don't like me easier. And it's not even a subconscious thing that I was aware of. Right. But I, I wasn't aware of it until after I started working with the vocal coach. And I was like, oh, I'm just not, I'm just not sounding like myself. <laughs> oh, I just don't sound like myself. There's, there's two things you can work on, right? There's there's the accent, the dialect that you're working on, and then the voice. So tell me a little bit about what you were working on with your vocal coach. A lot of breathing. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of breathing and grounding. It was. A, I really feel like it was more like mindfulness mm. um, and grounding. Because when you're grounded and you're in your, you can feel your feet on the ground, everything kind of settles, your voice settles, your body settles, you settle into yourself. And I think that was probably the most helpful, like all the random voice, you know, exercises we did. Yeah. They were, <laughs> you know, like 
super mm. helpful, but the most helpful was grounding myself. Mm. Um, because when you're grounded, when you're in your body, you are mm. in your body in every sense of the word. And right. it was, that's a scary place to be, especially when you're not used to it. Like I, you may think that you're grounded. I think a lot of the times I thought I was grounded, you know, and like, you know, I'm grounded versus like, and that's the idea of being grounded versus actually going through the process of being grounded. And they're two completely different things. Mm. And I'm someone who's like very type A, like I said, I'm like, I'm super type A. So I always want to do things perfectly. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that takes me out of the actual process of it. Cause I'm like, no, I'm, I'm grounded. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Right. Versus being like, oh, wait a minute. Am I grounded? Let me do a, a scan, a body scan and see where in my body I am not actually settled. It's a very, what does feel like? how do you tell? I it's, it's been interesting. There's a couple different things. I do a body scan. Um, and I realize where I, where I hold tension at and that's mm -hmm. taking time to figure out. Um, I hold tension in my, in my shoulders and my neck and in my mm -hmm. pelvic region, which is very random. But mm -hmm. I think it's probably because of my dance. It's like, it's the first thing I'm like, you know, all the tension goes there. Mm -hmm. um, and when I start to breathe and I just, it's, it's interesting putting your feet on the ground and just breathing, closing your eyes and letting right. it go for a second, like letting everything go. You know, sometimes where you suck your stomach in, put your shoulders back and you're in a position versus like, no, I'm grounded in exactly how I am. Like my stomach's mm -hmm. hanging out right now. You know what I'm saying? Like might not look the best. <laughs> you know? My shoulders are relaxed. They're not back. My boobs aren't out, but like I, this is how I am. This is who I am. Yeah. Yeah. And you have, grounding myself in just that has really helped in every way for me. Um, this, Even that is scary. Terrifying. Terrifying. So terrifying. Yeah. Because we, we're not sucking in. We're not, no. we're not putting our boobs out. You know, that's oh, terrifying. What if someone was to see it, you know, like, God forbid someone sees yeah. you in that state. Like, oh my God. And that's why, you know, like there's some people on Instagram that post, you know, pictures 8 a.m., 8.01 a.m. And then, you know, it's like they're still the same body. They just took it from a different angle, you know, mm. and it's like still having the same body. Yeah, you can still do that. You know, sometimes you need to suck it in and stick your boobs out, you know, depending on what you're doing, who you're playing. Fine. But ground yourself first, like know who mm. you are and where you stand first. Then all the other stuff can come later. That's so amazing. What was something that was surprising to you as you went through this process of getting to know your own voice? Oof. Oof. That I actually liked the way that I sounded. Oh! You wow. know, like, I, don't, I don't think I liked my voice because I wasn't using my voice, right? Mm -hmm. And also, you know, when you get, Julia Roberts says it in Pretty Woman, you get told you're stupid long enough, you start to believe you know, and I got told my voice was squeaky and awful and I sounded like a white girl. So it's like, that's something you start to believe. You get told that for mm -hmm. 20 years, you're like, okay, well, that must be true. So many people are saying it. Wow. I genuinely, it's taken me a long time. I am 35. It has taken me a long time, but I like my voice. That's the most, I like the way that I sound. And maybe it has nothing to do with the way that I sound versus I'm showing up authentically as myself. There's yeah. nothing that I'm holding back anymore. I am showing up a hundred percent me. And so I like that. I like that, mm -hmm. that I, you know, I like myself because I'm a hundred percent myself. And, uh, that you makes know, me like kind of tear up. That's so beautiful. <laughs> I love that. I love so, that. That's been the most surprising because it's not just, you know, mm -hmm. it's not just about the work and, you know, the craft. It's not, that transfers into every, every area of life, right? When you're not using your voice, it's not just when, yeah, you'll, it'll manifest itself in your work, but it doesn't start there. Like, you know, that's not where it starts. It's like, I like the sound of my voice and I didn't for a very long time. Wow. Yeah. Now using your voice for change or just for standing up for things that you believe in, do you feel like you're better prepared to do that now that you're coming from a place of love? I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, there, yeah, I think it all starts from that place. It all, mm -hmm. it, it has to start from that place, right? Like you can't, you can't speak up for somebody else if you haven't spoken up for yourself. 
Mm-hmm. You know, like if, if you're sitting there and trying to figure out who you, how can you lend a helping hand to anyone else? You need to figure your own stuff out. Mm-hmm. So you can show up for that other person and pour into that cup. But first your cup has to be full and you have to find that love for you. You know, like, mm-hmm. otherwise you're doing them a disservice in some way. Like you might be helping, but not in the capacity that you would be able to, if you had started with yourself. Yeah. You know? This work that you've done on yourself, how do you think you're going to be able to apply that to your character work as you're moving forward and you're acting? You know, I, I, I used to be someone when I did a self tape, for example, I would be someone who would do 40 takes and, you know, like just beating a dead horse. Like the, after 40 takes, there's nothing different that you're doing. <laughs> there's only so much. There's like minute little things, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, I don't know. And then you have to go through and watch 40 takes back. And you're like, fuck am I doing? You know, just make <laughs> a fucking nightmare. And then you can't pick. So when you have seven, eight takes that you send to your yeah. team, and they're like, what the fuck? So, <laughs> so I think now I trust myself. Mm. It's, it's like trust, you know, that came from trusting my voice. I think that was the last thing that, you know, like I had to be okay with my own voice. Right. And so now it's like, no, I trust my instrument. Mm. I trust my interest. I, once I've done the work, I can release it into the universe, right? Like I can just be, and I can let it go because I know that, Hey, I've done the work. I did the preparation and it, it changes the way that like now max I'll do eight, nine takes mm. and not because I'm like, Oh, I'm so, you know, I'm amazing. No, it's because it's like, no, I've done the work. So if we're at the point of me filming this and putting it on tape, I'm ready to go. Let's go. And I'm going to trust that the work that I've done and trust in my instrument enough to know that, okay, something's in it. We got something in those eight or nine mm. takes, you know? And it's, it's just, it's shifted my perspective. And I also think my work is freer. I'm a mm. lot freer. I'm a lot more open. I'm a lot more vulnerable. Um, and it, I think it's because, you know, when you're starting to use your, your voice, you know, it's like, it opens up all of this other stuff. It just, it opens you in such a way that, I don't know, man, it was kind it's of right like, right there, like the tip of your tongue, like, okay, yeah. all of my emotions are right there. Yeah. All accessible because I'm it's, open. It's open. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's really, it's shifted into my work and in, in such a dramatic way. And I think mm. it's, 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 it's not easy, but it's like a breath of fresh air. Mm. You know, I used to loathe doing self tapes because of that, you know, and then be worried about my voice. And like, I am <laughs> one of my acting teachers, <laughs> Leslie Khan, she's phenomenal. And I, you know, I got this role and, and she's like, you're, you're, you're just like, you're not really doing anything. And I'm like, well, I, I'm trying to sound. And she's like, wait, did they tell you to sound like this? And I was like, well, no, but like everyone keeps telling me that my voice and she's like, yeah, but you got booked with this voice. Right. So what are you doing? Because it's fucking up your acting. It's fucking up your work. Mm. And I was like, so me trying to sound like something different didn't work. It's like, I just needed to drop into me. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's honey, it's trial and error, man. Like, <laughs> you know, I did a lot of trial and error before I got here. So it wasn't like a overnight I had figured this out and came to this conclusion. It was a lot of trial and error. Well, that's what I love about acting though, is that your craft um changes as you change. Yeah. And the way you approach the craft changes. The way you show up on screen or on stage. It yeah. all is a continuous change as you understand yourself more or go through different phases of life. Yeah. It's so rich. It's, I, I remember mean- being in acting school, doing all this inner work, really thinking about who I was, who I wanted to be, all of the things that actors think about constantly. Mm-hmm. And then I would, I would be like, wait, so the biology students are just learning biology? <laughs> they're, not, <laughs> they're, not just doing, they're not doing all this all these hours of lying on the floor and thinking about who they are and thinking about their breath. Like, how do they even show up to life? Like, how do you show up authentically to your own life when you don't spend the hours thinking about that? Yeah. And it's it's true. It's like, it's constant evolution, but that's art that in general, to me, that's art, you know, like you're constantly evolving in your art and you should be, if Mm -hmm. you're not, then you're like, go reevaluate. 
but you should be constantly growing and evolving. And that I think that's one of my favorite things about the fact that I'm an artist is that I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly changing. What worked four years ago for me as an actor does not work now, you know? And I did just like, oh, that's just another thing in the toolbox, you know? Okay. So now we got to learn some more things in the toolbox and it doesn't get old. Like the mm -hmm. more that you learn, the more full your work becomes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think there's ever a point. That's the reason I think like some of the greatest actors, they always go back to theater because it's like, it, fill your cup up. You know, mm -hmm. every time you get back on stage, you're like, you're like, oh, let me, you could be on stage. I've been on stage since I was a kid. Every time I go back to stage, it's, you're learning something new. Mm -hmm. You're learning something new constantly, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, man, we're lucky. I <laughs> think we're really, yeah. really, we're really, really lucky to get to do what we do. Mm, that's incredible. Um, so now approaching accents in different roles that you get in the future, how do you think you're going to approach it? Or is there a different thing you're going to um, do? So during the, during the quarantine, I went down the rabbit hole of reading every monologue book, which I have like a lot. <laughs> cool. I have probably like yeah. 20, 20 monologue books. Like, wow. just, what else are we doing, right? Like, we were just at home. I lived by myself, you know, me yeah, and the dog. Like, why not? Let's read 4,000 monologues. Yeah. Yeah. So that would read them in different accents just to try things or, you know. Cool. And some of them I would put on tape. And th this is me three, four hours of doing a monologue, you know, in different <laughs> accents mm -hmm. just for, for fun. And approaching the accents like you know i tried a lot of different things and then i was like you know what i want to be able to do um, a british accent and i want to be able to do a southern accent mm -hmm. and my process i didn't have you okay audrey i didn't have you so uh <laughs> i was okay. just you know on youtube and it was a combination awesome. of youtube is interesting i i mean YouTube is interesting. I used YouTube, but I also, for me, what's most helpful is hearing it over and over. Mm -hmm. Hearing it. Like just having, hearing the sound and how, you know, different people in that space, how they, what they sound like. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, hours a day just listening to it. And Amazing. that's what, yeah, that's what helped me with my accent. I did, I did uh, Joan of Arc um, in a British accent and I did, uh, August Wilson's, uh, oh goodness, I forget. I think it was Seven Guitars. Um, mm -hmm. August Wilson's Seven Guitars. Um, and yeah, it's that was helpful for me. Cool. Yeah. I mean, that's what all of us do. As a, as a coach, that's what I would do. I would take an accent that someone needs to do. I'll listen to different clips, but then I'll listen to it over and over and over on a slowed down speed. So yeah. I'll put it on 50% speed on YouTube and then listen yeah. to it over and over i'll take little tiny sections mm -hmm. and just repeat them over and 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 like write it down <laughs> and figure out where it is in the body That's and then when you yeah. coach it to someone it all feels different for each person that you coach it to as well like yeah. you may take an accent and uh your your british accent and your joan of arc piece you might feel like it's really here someone mm -hmm. else might feel like it's really here and it's it's all so personal to your body. So personal. But and I also, I, also uh, I totally vibe with what you're saying is it sits in your body. Every accent sits in your body in a different place. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Like yeah. my Southern accents, like I can feel it in my stomach. Like my, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, <laughs> it's such, yeah. it's so interesting that you said that. Yeah. Yeah. It's magical to do different voices because you also yeah. start to understand people better as well. The more accents that you do, you're like, whoa, I, I can empathize with different kinds of people better because I, I've put that in my body. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I yeah. tried that on like some clothes and tried it on, took it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's do you have any advice for actors or regular people who are, um, trying to reckon with their voice or their sound or who are trying to just improve their craft. I mean, you have a 30 year career, <laughs> a 30 year professional career that you're drawing from and still learning constantly, which is incredible. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think, and that's with anyone, just never stop learning. 
mm. like always be seeking the truth of what you're doing. And that mm. comes with just learning, take intake as much as you can. Um, you won't be sorry about learning something new. You may not use it. Have you ever, have you ever learned too many things at once where it got overwhelming? Yeah. A hundred percent. Because I'm type A, like, let me do all the things, you yeah. know? So I don't suggest that, but I mean, in the sense of like long-term, never stop learning, never stop mm -hmm. growing. Um, I think that some people get to a place and they're like, no, I'm professional. So therefore it's like, no. No, no, no. Like the, the greatest artists are, are always evolving, are always pushing themselves, stretching themselves, trying to learn new things. Um, and, and who is it? Lauren Hill said it. Lauren Hill said anything that's not growing is dead. Mm -hmm. So the growing and the evolution of the craft, I think for me, is the most important. In You're light, green and growing or ripe and rotting? That's it. Ooh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, ripe and rotting. I'm here for it. Yeah, right. Uh, yep, I like it. Um, yeah, so I think that is probably that that would be my biggest advice to anybody like actor or not like just keep growing keep especially for actors keep training like it, the, going back into a class after you've been on set will get your especially if it's a good class will get your ass together because you're in a group of your peers you know what i'm saying and mm -hmm. you get told the truth on set everybody's like oh you're so great you know unless it's the director and it's like Ooh. but everybody's like oh my or god i like coach right <laughs> yeah. you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know but other than that you know like everyone's like they don't say anything or they're like you know mm -hmm. they're somebody like oh no it was great when you're in class uh, no you know what I'm saying? Like everybody's yeah. trying to get better. Everyone's paying mm -hmm. money to be there. And it's a very different energy. Mm -hmm. And you will get your ass handed to you going back into a class after you've been on set. That's my favorite thing to do at like in between. It's like, oh, I got to go. <laughs> yeah, and the first couple classes are always scary because for me, I want the respect of my peers, right? I yeah. want... I want my peers to be like, wow, that's great work. That means something to me, especially people that I, Erica Michelle, you know, prime example. Mm -hmm. Like I, I would want her to be like jazz. That was phenomenal. You know, mm -hmm. that means something to me because it's coming from someone that I respect her work. I respect who she is. I respect her work ethic in the craft. Mm -hmm. so, so getting a SAG award as well. Like, okay, these, my peers yeah. voted for me. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it's, that to me means something. So going back into class is like the training it's, mm -hmm. it's, and you know, I, even if you're, you know, Meryl Streep, Daniel Day Lewis, you know, whatever, they always go back to theater. They might mm -hmm. not go back to class, but they always go back to theater and theater is no joke. <laughs> like mm -hmm. theater's very different than TV film. There is no, let's go back to one. Sorry. Can I take it again? There is, you're on stage for two hours and you're going to sink or you're going to swim. And there's however many people in the audience staring back at you. Mm -hmm. And if you're not there in the moment, it's for everybody to see, right. you know, and you will learn very quickly. Oh, I need to do this, 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 and this to prepare myself to be on stage for two hours. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of stamina. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is really important to be the most well-rounded actor that you can be, um, mm -hmm. you know, and train. That's, that's my, that's my two cents. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having You're this conversation so with me today. This is amazing. Thank I'm you so for happy. dropping all these incredible gems. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> nuggets of knowledge that so many people can grow from. I hope so. I, I mean, I hope so. If anything, yeah. like my purpose on and goal in this life is to, if it touches or reaches somebody, it, even if it's one person, then joy. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Guys, thank you. Thank you. Okay. See ya. <laughs> Bye.